Hello, and welcome to Targeted Disruption Toward Innovative Change in Music Teacher Education. My colleagues and I are excited to lead this workshop together today. We are the music education faculty members at Butler University in Indianapolis, Indiana, in the United States of America. I'm Dr. Becky Marsh, choral music education faculty member. Dr. Brian Widener, instrumental music education. Dr. Penny Dimmick, general music education. This session comes from our experiences with our students who come in with preconceived ideas of what music education is, what their identity as music educators happens to be, and how a music education classroom should work. This takes its roots from the tradition of research into the apprenticeship of observation. And when we look at music education broadly, we find that for many students in our undergraduate music education programs, they have already defined a lot of their pedagogy pedagogical knowledge based on K-12 models. Um, their professional identity of what it means to be a music teacher has been set up, and there's a persistence of what they learn in pre-K through 12 that carries over into what they do in their classrooms, uh, both as undergraduate pre-service teachers and in their early career as uh, professionals. When we look at this uh, through the lens of general education, we find that um, there's a focus on creating systemic processes for overcoming this apprenticeship of observation, recognizing that there are real benefits to it that our students build upon, but likewise that as uh, music teacher educators, we need to provide a model for how teachers learn uh, that recognizes their experiences, that creates disruption in that process, and eventually translates into meaningful pedagogy moving forward. When we're looking at this process of self-replication, we find that there, our students' education starts in their pre-K through 12 experiences. And most notably, here in the United States, we find that that is dominated by their ensemble music experiences, seeing themselves as band, choir, and orchestra musicians, who then become orchestra, band, and choir teachers. When they come into their collegiate experiences, we find that a lot of what we do here in the institution reinforces those models that they had already. It's very teacher-centric. It focuses on active doing, but perhaps with minimal critical thinking oriented with it. It's very much focused on performance as opposed to learning of concepts and strongly positioned in Western music practices that really orient our students as professional musicians first and foremost and educators second. It's not surprising then that when we go from their pre-collegiate experiences into their collegiate experiences, that their professional experience very much resembles that which they've previously seen and previously experienced, thereby informing the next generation of music educators who focus on replicating those same teacher-centric, performance-orientated uh, Western practices. Framed by the information that we have now about self-replicating cycles, let's zoom in and consider the first step in this process at Butler University, which for us has been to identify points of replication at our own institution. The first that we identify is the fact that music is identified as participating in large ensembles, that that is viewed as legitimate and is further reinforced by the degree requirements for large ensemble participation. Because the bulk of our students come from traditional performance ensemble backgrounds, this cycle is then replicated at Butler University. Within the large ensemble experience, another point of replication is the continued programming of music that is primarily from the Western canon which is also primarily composed by white men, often composers who are no longer living. As we think about our music educators, who are our future music educators, they're coming from having been students, and specifically student performers from these large ensembles. And when they get to the university and they continue to be performers in large ensembles, they now have an increased expectation of performance on their applied instrument through weekly lessons and recitals and other requirements, which perpetuates their identity as performers rather than nurturing and further developing their identity as future music educators. Another aspect of a point of replication, specifically within the area of Indiana and the Midwest where we are situated, is that we have a homogeneity within our student population. So we are a primarily white institution, 
But when you look at the other barriers to access to Butler University, including the tuition, um, of course, the requirements to be admitted into the School of Music, that is a nationwide um, consideration, we are a very homogenous group of, of students as well as faculty. Perpetuated not only through the large ensemble experience, but in general, through the type of teaching and the experiences that are happening in music classrooms at the university is a very autocratic approach where it's very director centric. And that is the, the experience that has that our students have come from and their K-12 experiences that they continue to see at the collegiate level and then will replicate in their own practice if not disrupted and sustained to be different in some way. Lastly, but certainly not the least important, is one that feels very present particularly in the Indian, Indiana and Indianapolis metropolitan area, which is the role of competition and the importance of competition for the students who enter this program. It is the exception for us to have a student from the Indianapolis metro area or really the entire state of Indiana who has not had competition as a large part of their performing ensemble experience. This is true for concert ensembles, including band, choirs, and orchestra, as well as very heavily in marching band and show choir competition. So to associate music education with competition is something that we have to disrupt and provide alternatives to thinking about. To give you a little background on our university, we are obviously an American university. Our music education program is a four-year program, and the ultimate um, goal is for students to uh, earn their degree and also earn licensure uh, to allow them to teach in a public or private school. Our curriculum is designed so that our music education students are in a music education class every semester that they are on campus. The curriculum is on this slide for you and if you look at those courses that are highlighted in blue, those are the courses that every music education student takes. Courses that are highlighted in green are courses that just our instrumental students take. And then the courses that are highlighted in purple are obviously for just the choral music education students. Now our students are in other education courses. Uh, for example, they have coursework within our College of Education. And then they also, the instrumental students, also have other instrumental techniques courses that they take. Um, and of course, all of our students take the common music core. To give you a context for our music education program, you have sitting before you the three faculty members. We are the music education faculty uh, at Butler. <clears throat> we are housed in the School of Music and we have generally strong support and we also have the majority of the students within the School of Music are actually music education majors. The School of Music is a part of the Jordan College of the Arts our dean is actively searching for community responsiveness and arts leadership in Indy, and she is incredibly supportive of the music education program. And then we are obviously part of Butler University, and innovation is a primary leg of the Butler strategic plan, and so we have great support for the, whenever, for the designing and the restructuring of programs and for all of the things that we're trying to do in the music education program. So now we'd like to take a moment and pause for a moment and ask you, what are the self-replicating cycles that you see existing from your students' pre-K through 12 experiences? So when we start talking about um, disrupting the self-replicating cycle, um, we're recognizing that we are positioned as spot to interrupt it at the collegiate level, recognizing that it potentially could be interrupted anywhere throughout this. And the first step in this initial disrupt is an initial disruption of presenting that there is indeed another option than what the students K-12 or pre-K-12 experiences had been. So we identify within our program where these init initial disruptions happen, which are intentionally designed by us in each of these classes. So you might remember from the slide that showed our curriculum that we have a two-semester sequence of introductory music education courses 
ME 101 that occurs in the first semester and ME 102 that occurs in the second semester. ME 101 really focuses on disrupting the notion of, um, first of all, getting us started with what it means to actually be a teacher. So disrupting, hey, you've been a student for how many tens of thousands of hours and how many days, and now you have to start thinking like a teacher. So it's important for us that our students are out in the field early and often, and as NASM, our NASM, our National Accrediting Handbook would say, authentic field experiences, so in real classrooms. But the disruptive piece for us is making sure that we're not only taking students into large ensemble classrooms. So we go into a non-ensemble classroom, a general music classroom, and our students work with real students in a real classroom. The next thing that we are trying to shake up is the performance-based focus that our students bring to music education. So we're trying to get them to think about music teaching and learning rather than from one concert to the next, moving them from concerts to concepts, conceptually focused teaching in the music classroom. In ME 102, moving to that next semester, we focus on um, making sure that we are creating a space in our classrooms and have using teaching practices that are supporting diverse populations of learners and several aspects of diversity, which means understanding who your students are and what your students' identities mean for the ways that are gonna be most meaningful to them in the classroom when it comes to music teaching and learning. There's also a great deal of collaborative creation so that um, we learn not only from a music standpoint that music is not just one person doing something in a group, but that there can and should be collaboration, but also collaborative planning of teaching and other experiences so that we are preparing them for the realities of, again, what is expected as a teacher and that we're disrupting this notion of one person has to do everything and be the only person responsible for themselves. Within that disruption of teacher identity, we also have our syllabi and use, use verbiage frequently in our classes that talk about professionalism. We treat our students as young professionals, early career professionals from the moment they enter this program, rather than what might be seen as a, as a typical participation grade or a typical attendance grade. We have professionalism expectations of students that include all of the expectations of what a professional should be doing in the workplace, including dispositions as well as um, the more pragmatic arriving on time, coming prepared, and so forth. We also have our students engaged from the first semester in maintaining a professional development log so that they are for, for a twofold purpose. One, so that they, that they gain experience in the practice of documenting your own continuing education, which is a, which is a required part of being a professional music educator, and also that they begin to think about their own continued development as professional development and not just a class or not just a one-off meeting or something like that. One opportunity that has been afforded us over the past semesters and in the future is that um, Dr. Widener and I have been invited to direct ensembles and when not directing ensembles, guest lead pieces um, that we get to choose. And that allows us an opportunity to disrupt the students' large ensemble experience when we get to work with them. So that means that we focus on comprehensive musicianship, right, as a model for what happens in a large ensemble space rather than just working towards that narrow performance outcome. We also have our students engage in directorless ensemble experiences that really gets rid of that um, director-centric model and allows for student voice and working through um, the advantages and also challenges of that. We also make sure that we're not working in a silo in our own ensemble experiences when we have the opportunity to lead so that we're bringing in outside stakeholders, other community leaders and, and, and musicians, and also culture bearers um, to work with our students. So let's take a moment to pause and for each of us to reflect and share. What are additional opportunities for initial disruption of these self-replicating cycles at your institutions? So once we've introduced that initial disruption, the next stage of this process is to move to sustained experiences. That initial disruption is really about positioning the students to understand that there is another option from what they had had. 
The idea of the sustained experience is that it provides an intentional modeling of that disruptive experience and that the students are able to see themselves actually placed, embodied within whatever that alternative experience might be. That they aren't just visiting somewhere else, but rather they're able to really truly understand how a different approach to music education could potentially work. We build this into several of our courses and we're going to highlight a few of those spots here. Um, in our Brass Techniques curriculum, which is a two semester long curriculum, um, we do what all Brass Techniques classes do, which is introduce students to trumpet, horn, euphonium, trombone, tuba. But along with that, um, as I teach this class, I make a point of integrating several of the practices that we hope our students carry into their classroom. These classes are taught completely without a traditional textbook or a method book using a flipped classroom model. Students are engaging with videos outside of class that prepare them uh, with a sound before sight sort of model. Um, but then we come into the classroom and are able to engage in the messiness of teaching brass instruments. Um, there's a lot of imitative performance that happens through this and there's an inclusion of many non-art or non-western art music practices and oral learning. Uh, doing things along the lines of bringing in Mexican mariachi and Mexican banda, uh, Romani koshek music, and Balkan turba music. And by experiencing brass in these alternative settings, they start to be able to see brass um, performance outside of the realm of just orchestral or uh, band performance, but rather as a cultural component that they can use. Um, throughout the class, we're doing a lot of improvisation, a lot of composition, again, reinforcing the idea that this is something that can be used not just in the advanced classroom, but at the very beginning level. The very first activity that we do in the first week of class is an improvisation activity, and that continues all the way through. Teaching the Young Singer is designed to, to achieve similar outcomes as brass techniques, but for our choral music education students. This class is focused on teaching the young singer, specifically from late elementary school all the way through uh, adolescence into high school. We start with an exploration of vocal identity, first understanding how our voices shape sometimes our perceptions of ourselves or reflect aspects of our identity, and knowing what that means for working with young singers who are navigating all kinds of aspects related to their identity and how voice plays into that. Sound before sight is an important component, but specifically the focus of this class is to help shake up the notion um, of rote teaching as a poor or lazy practice, which is very prevalent in um, many large ensemble focused circles. We talk about the role of music notation in various styles of learning and various vocal practices and how they play how it may or may not be an important part of the practice. So we explore road traditions and road experiences that can be valuable in and of themselves and authentic to a musical practice and road experiences that can set up a pathway when designed well and intentionally to music reading in a notation-based capacity. Culturally relevant teaching is something that we continue to embed into all of our courses, but in this particular class, we really focus on meeting students where they are in terms of vocal identity. Do they need rote, do they need rote teaching? What types of rote experiences do they need or would be valuable? But meeting students where they are in terms of what music are they already bringing with them? What sorts of musicianship and things do they already have? And rather than saying, the music that is from the canon or is this that we've always done, these are the great masterworks that we always do and trying to get students to be to that point saying, what music is in their everyday lives and how can we meet them there and honor that rather than a bait and switch to get them to do something that we'd like them to do so that we can find both and rather than a means to simply get to a more narrow way of choral music making. Contemporary choral practices really focuses on contemporary topics in, in choral music education. So specifically expanded repertoire, right? Uh, shaking things up from the canon, but also um, thinking about large performance ensembles that maybe aren't just um, a concert choir or aren't just performance based. So um, that means not just representation of different composers within these genres, but also different genres and different practices and how do we actually teach and lead those? Or who should we bring in to help us do that more meaningfully? Inclusive practices is of course a theme, but particularly in contemporary choral practices, we, um, we use a text that really focuses on all of the aspects of a person and the ways that music functions in their lives, that we can make sure that we are creating a space 
both our physical space in our classrooms and that we create with our own teaching and with our language that is inviting and welcoming and honors all of the people in, who enter that choral space and hopefully have more enter that choral space because they know the type of environment that it is and it is an inclusive one. It would be impossible to teach a class titled Contemporary Choral Practices without talking about the contemporary and critical pressing issues that are existing in our society, in education, and what that means for music education, and specifically what that means for working with singers. These issues include um, gender expansive pedagogies, working with um, gender diversity and trans voices particularly. It includes how to navigate the types of music that you might program that perhaps um, favor one type of religious background over another or one type of um, music knowledge over another. Really understanding issues of access and equity and inclusion, again, and what that means in a choral music education space. So administration of school music programs is a role play of sorts for our students. Um, each student is basically assigned as the teacher of a hypothetical school and throughout the class they engage with all of the non-classroom sorts of things that music educators have to do that often first year teachers really struggle with. This is how to communicate, how to engage with parents, with administrators, with other stakeholders, how to do a presentation to a school board, how to uh, establish budgets and be able to maneuver through those. We really center the class on philosophy, making sure that we start from a position of what is most important to you? What do you want to make sure is in your classroom? And then every other aspect of that is imitated um, and played out through that philosophy. Um, one of the key pieces for this class, for example, are our surprise emails, which are emails that we have collected from teachers from throughout the community that are just the hard parent and administrator communications that we need to have. They receive one of these and in you know, role-played fashion, need to respond to them even if it does come in at two o'clock in the morning and we're complaining about last night's concert or it's uh, in the middle of your lunch period and being yelled at uh, by a parent for something that isn't your fault. And how do you respond to that, not just in terms of the content, but in terms of the presentation to make sure that our students are prepared when they leave our program to not just be music teachers in the classroom, but be the administrators of their programs as well. So in the junior year, our students have sustained experiences that are connected with specific methods courses that they're taken. These experiences are uh, embedded practicum at two different levels. The first semester, it is at the elementary general music level, and then the second semester, it will be at secondary middle school or secondary uh, choral or instrumental level. These particular experiences are such that they are, um, we take our what we're talking about in class or the theory of what we're what the students are learning and then they take it directly into the uh, k-12 classroom whichever one they happen to be working in and and are expected to not only practice that but then to reflect also on that so they have the theory first and then they have the opportunity to actually teach and work with students and then they have to come back and reflect and and put that all together um, one a great example I can give of that is as we're talking about uh, the child's singing voice and how the children sing and how do we teach singing to children, the, the requirement that particular week is also that in their practicum experience they do get to teach a song and then they will come back and talk about that. The, um, the other unique part about this is that we have a full year general music curriculum. First semester is uh, K through 12, K, excuse me, K through five or six, depending on the uh, school corporation. And then second semester, they do have a, um, an entire semester looking at secondary general music, which runs the range from anything about how to teach a ukulele course or how to teach AP music theory. And through that, throughout that particular thing, the students design, are designing a curriculum that they could turn around then and teach in a secondary um, general music class. So we're gonna pause here again, and we'd like to ask you, what are some additional possibilities for sustained experiences to interrupt self-replicating cycles? And we'd like to discuss this for a few moments.
So once we've done that initial disruption, we've now given students that sustained experience uh, to be able to not just uh, know that there's another option, but understand how it works. We're now able in our methods coursework and other classes to really dig into the intentional pedagogies that oftentimes are the starting point for the undergraduate music, experience, music education experience. This is about explicitly invest, investigating the philosophical orientations of different approaches, um, understanding how music works for different sorts of learners, and really focusing on concept-driven instruction. And the goal of this is that by the time we've gotten to intentional pedagogy, we're not talking about something that the students have never seen happen before, but it's rather something that they have experienced that very first time and now had that sustained experience to make it so that's meaningful and that they can see it as part of their own education moving forward. In designing our music education curriculum, we have chosen five pillars that are the foundations of our curricular design. Understanding by design, UBD, or backward design as it's sometimes called, um, is something that we implement in designing our own coursework and that we also prepare our students to do when they are thinking about um, music teaching and learning. You've heard this and many others about many other things in this presentation, but the fact that music is for all learners is absolutely a pillar of this foundation. And so that there is a, a conceptual thread through all of our music, educa music education classes of accessibility and making that not just the belief that music is for everyone, but that all students can be musical and that there are things we can do as teachers to actually make that the reality. Social constructivism is a big piece of our, uh, of our music, education, music education curriculum. We believe that constructivist practices place students at the center of their own learning and really allow students to take ownership of what they are learning. We model that in our own practices as teachers and we help our future educators to design um, uh, lessons and activities that are constructivist in nature. The philosophical foundations aspect of these five pillars is one that we work with our students to develop from their first semester here all the way through their student teaching and we know that their philosophies will continue to develop as they have more experiences. Importantly, we want our students to understand and to make connections to this that what they believe, their philosophy about music teaching and learning, informs every decision that they make in their own classrooms. With this understanding and a constant reflectiveness and evaluating their own philosophies and their own practices, we hope that this will shape um, what they believe and give them a strong foundation as they move into this profession. Something that you'll see in each of our music education courses is largely centered around um, project-based learning. We want our students' um, assignments and the way that we assess their learning to be based in application and to be based in the types, the type of work that they'll be doing once they are in this profession. So you'll see um, smaller, smaller assignments and planning and activities and teaching built into, now that you have this information and these experiences, how would you design this? So there's a lot of application and interaction of concepts in the projects that we assign throughout our coursework. As my colleague said earlier, it's not about making sure that we name each of these components of these five foundations of our pillar from day one, right? In, in the same way that we talk about sound before sight, we talk about experience before understanding. So that means for us that we have in our sequence from the first year through that senior year and capstone student teaching, scaffolded learning within each of these five pillars so that there is first an experience and living in the theory or the why we're doing this and why it matters. And then later in our students' time, particularly in those junior and senior years, that we're naming these experiences and these conceptual focuses that our students have been living for, for it at any given time more than two years during their time in the program. Let's take a moment to pause and think, what are key concepts that are foundational to music educator preparation that should be taught theoretically and pedagogically? These could be in the field at large or at your own institutions. So to come full circle, um, what we're proposing is that we look at these self-replicating cycles from a point of interruption at the collegiate level. That through those initial disruptions that present that there is another, through sustained experiences that allow students to truly understand what it's like to live in a different music practice, 
and then intentional pedagogy that allows them to understand the theory the, that lies behind those practices, their students are then able to change their own professional practice. That as they enter into the classroom, they're able to look at themselves and the philosophies that they hold at the center to allow themselves to challenge traditions that are in place, to honor things that they believe are important, and in the end, provide the next generation of music educators a different sort of experience that is more inclusive, that is uh, more embracing of all the different ways that people can be musical, to make music education something that we enter into fully aware of what we're doing, as opposed to just passively um, recreating what's already happened. Um, we're hoping that at the end here, we can continue our conversation further with you um, and encourage you, one, to please reach out and contact us with questions that you have about what we've done here at Butler University and about ways that you might change your undergraduate practices. But we'd like to conclude um, with a continued discussion of these four big points that we've outlined throughout this presentation. First of all, just identifying where those points of replication are opportunities that we have for initial disruption, uh, chances that we have to be able to sustain experiences and alternative practices, and finally, what intentional pedagogies we want to bring in. And hopefully, in a moment, we'll be back here live with you to have those conversations. Thank you so much for joining us this evening.